Good evening. Welcome to Larry Rinker Golf Live. Hope you're having a great week. Can't believe the Masters is next week. Happy Easter coming up in just a few days. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by my friend, 3D expert and PGA Tour coach, Mr. John Sinclair. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Larry. Thanks for having me back on. Well, it's always great to have you on. I've learned so much from you. You probably have more 3D data on PGA Tour swings than anybody. And so it's pretty, it's always neat to talk about what the truth is, not what people think happens in a golf swing, but really what the truth is. So what's new and exciting? Well, and the, the newest thing is we've been doing a lot of uh, work and look at the impact zone and looking from about club parallel to club parallel through the impact zone. So we've been doing a lot of studies and, and looks at that over the last you know, bunch of years. But that seems to be a little bit of a focus uh, for some people right now. And uh, so I've even put out a video on my Facebook page. You can go look at that and uh, on how I worked with a student working on his impact position and how his arms rotating through impact. Wow, that's cool. Well, I want to share a slide here from uh, V1. And this is me with the club at shaft parallel to the ground coming into the ball. I only have one hand on the club. And here's my right hand. And so I look at this and there's the club moving 180 degrees around the circle. And there's my right hand. So my hand or the handle of this club has moved this far. So if I take it around the circle, it's moved it, let's just say the arm has moved the club that far. So to me, what is moving this club, this other 80% that the club's moving? And in this scenario, my uh, left arm is not on the club. So the body rotation, the chest is just rotate a little bit. And when I put both hands on it and do it, now, now the, both hands, the arms are turning the chest. So uh, what is moving this club, as you say, from shaft parallel to the ground to shaft parallel to the ground coming into the ball? Well, I mean, it's several things. Everything obviously has its a little bit, but certainly the wrists are responsible if we're just talking about the true club head of bringing it all the way across and and then I would argue that it's probably more the lead wrist for the the players that that's really dominating and that the right wrist at that point is really just trying to keep up and the, the more you can get the right side to go faster and move and get through the ball then the the less you know retardation it would give to the grip of the club so I would say it's the the left wrist here we can pull back that's right back in here. Maybe we can back up. But I would say more in the, in the swing, we're talking about that really moving the club, that rotation right there. And then the right hand coming through is really trying to keep up with that. So this motion one-handed obviously would be the right hand, but once you're turning this whole left side, is pulling and that supination of the lead wrist and the extension of the lead wrist is what's really powering that motion and pulling kind of back up at us as we go and really moving that club versus the right hand really pushing it through. Thank you, the right hand is, is trying to keep up. Right, well, you know, I've just been thinking about this. So if I'm a basketball player and I'm a lefty, and I'm shooting free throws. So that's my trail wrist doing that. And if I'm a tennis player and serving, so I'm, you know, my hand and wrist is doing this to hit a serve. So now as a golfer, I, I think of this right hand, you know, how far, how, how much, you know, how much this is happening. And, you know, to me, that's an active movement. That's me, that's me actively doing that because I could be very passive and not make it go fast or I can say my forearms hands and wrist I'm cracking the whip and making that thing really go fast uh that's a great feeling what's that 
I said, that's a good feeling to have to try to get your right side to go fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Because yeah. the faster we can make it go, the less pullback we're going to have on that club. So when I looked at 3D for speed there for a lot of years, I would, I would really look at the extension of the right arm and how fast, you know, the wrist is moving and, and rotating. And then as we got into it a lot with, all the PhDs that I work with and the most notable one would be Dr. McKenzie. And he started to show me actually what's going on with the right side. And his best explanation was with this right side coming into impact, it's like having a, a bicycle with not a free gear. So you're pedaling as fast as you can and you can accelerate it so much, which actually happens back in here with that right arm. And then from that point on, your feet being on the pedals is just slowing it down. So if you wanted to speed up, you just let it go. So in truth, I kind of look at the right side as guiding the club through there and then trying to keep up with that left side. And the faster I can move it, the less it's going to want to pull back. Right. And we saw a lot of this in baseball. I looked at uh, baseball was easier to film. So when I worked with some major league teams and we'd see the, the bats come into the ball, we would see that bat starting to leave their hands. And then when they make impact with the ball, you'd see it go crashing into the back of the hand. So I've got a picture of Freddie Couples I just showed you earlier that we- Yeah, really let's see that. It. Let's see that uh, Freddie Couples video. Yeah, Freddie let's see. Really. Let's make sure. But it's amazing how the right hand with Freddie is coming off the. Off Make sure we can see Freddie, that really good. You can see it now. So as you see, when he's coming into that, you can see right there, his right hand is just really not on the club much at all. Right. You can see it. He's extending the elbow. He's flexing the wrist. And watch what happens right at impact, how that hand just crashes into the club right there. Right. So that's what I was just talking about in the baseball. It's right. just crashing. So that hand at impact, that trail hand actually caught up to the club. It was, and if you look back there, you can see that right through that area, how it's really kind of pulling on those two fingers, the middle finger and the ring finger. Yeah. And then right when he hits the impact, it just goes forward. So wow. he's feeling a lot of pressure, you know, right there. And that it's pulling back on it. And then all of a sudden it goes into that impact. Right. So that movement really is that from this point down is that supination of the lead wrist if we're just talking about what is the active forces moving that club across your screen, from that point, I'm gonna put it on the left side more so than the right side. The right side, I just want you going as fast as you can to keep up. Well, would it be safe to say that if I was hitting a seven iron and trapping it and hitting, you know, and hitting more against my leader left arm versus a driver where the club head's going faster, wouldn't you say the left wrist where the driver is going into extension or cupping a lot sooner and faster than a seven iron? Certainly faster, not always sooner, but faster. But faster. I mean, we're going the faster. angles are changing faster. Correct. And then you see, you know, you saw a lot of uh, people out there recently. I think they had a uh, Bryson DeChambeau picture posed after like his yeah, yeah, yeah. Pose. And then, you know, they forget to show the fact that he just dug a trench about two feet wide and it sticks in the ground. And so then they think, you know, they call it the flying wedge, which I don't believe is possible. Never even tried it. We've had tons of people try it, but at any speed, that's not a possible thing. So yeah, when you hit against your, that feeling of hitting against it, and if you hit it against the ground, you'll have that solid feel, but you're right. Right. Definitely trying to go. And so that there's a lot of misinformation out there on that. And thinking that the you know you just crashed into a ball of violence, right? And right. you saw what happened to Freddie's hand at the yeah. crash, and you hit the ground most likely with a knife. But actually holding that 
you know, I don't even see it. No player does it even on a little short shot. But probably inside of 40, 30 yards, you could probably do it. And it wouldn't be a very good shot, but he could probably hold it pretty good. But that's about it because you're just not strong enough. Well, from looking at Bryson DeChambeau's swing, it looks as if he's not going, his wrist isn't going this way nearly as much as Freddie's for sure. You know, and, you know, that flying wedge. You know. Well, I think that's a pretty unique uh, angle that we got of Freddie is that if we looked at Bryson's, it's moving pretty good too. It's just the ground stopped it. Oh, I've seen okay. that. You know, a guy hits it fat and it doesn't go this way. Exactly. And once you get the ground, it stopped it. And then actually redoes it. And if you want to go look on my Twitter page, I actually on that, I can't remember who, who had it on there, but I actually posted one of my kids hitting a, you know, just a reasonable speed, probably a, a quarter speed shot against the impact bag. And, you know, here he is releasing the club and he hits it and all of a sudden he goes like that. Right. So, so that's right. exactly what we're talking about. And there's a ton of misinformation thinking that, you could actually increase this all the way through those points that they're showing on the video. That's not possible. That's not even a good golf swing. Right. So. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting. If you look at my wrist, my wrist, you know, how, how can you even see that? You know, I'm going to do it a lot, but how can you even see these in, you know, just looking at film? How can you even see what's going on? That's where 3D is so interesting. And that you can actually measure how much that's going on. And, you know, something is regarding these hands and wrist angles is, you know, lag is overrated at the top. Like this idea that we got, we got to pull and we got to lag the club. So what's the data say about that? Yeah, well, it'll give you two. I'll just show you both of them since we got the color in hand. It'll give you two pictures. So if I pull the club down, you can see that what we talk about lag is this shaft versus my fork. Right. So when I pull the club down, it'll make it look like I've got good lag right there in a two-dimensional video. And when I get close, you can see what that just did to my wrist angles. So I extended my wrist. I pulled down this way, which is what I see every amateur that hadn't had a coach do. Okay. So they're actually twisting the club open when they do that. And, and if I do it the right way, you can see I can produce the same look between this one and this one. Right. I get that same amount of lag, but now my hands went this way. So I flexed my lead wrist. Right. And extended my right wrist. And what a lot of people don't realize is the axis of the right hand, give it a little cast. You know, Nicholas used to talk about, felt like he threw it from the back. Right. Well, he was actually right because we give it a little owner. And that makes that club go up and back. Right. Okay. And then it also produces a two-dimensional look of, of lag and actually a three-dimensional look of lag of that shaft and this forearm that actually would measure out to be the same as the bad lag. So there's good lag and there's bad lag. And then we want at the bottom, we want to get rid of that lag pretty quickly. And that's where the original thought comes in. So the better players, that angle between the left arm and the shaft of the club right there, I'll use my pencil here, but that angle, they're actually, that, that angle is, is, uh, they're not increase. That's they're, they're no, they increase it. sooner. They do increase it. Yeah. They're increasing that, but they're doing it this way. And when you do it that way, you will dump a little this way. That's not oh, taking that angle away. It's moving the club upward. Right. Right. And I'm in, I can increase that angle doing it that way. Right. Or this way. But the yeah. proper way is to close the club face early and do it that way. And then this measurement can just be fooled by doing it the wrong way or the correct. Right. So I think that's really interesting. That's in your video. If people want to watch the wrist angle video that you did, they can go to John Sinclair. Uh, johnsinclairgolf.com, correct? Yeah, just sinclairgolf.com. Just sinclairgolf, S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R, sinclairgolf.com. But, uh, you know, just some fascinating information. Bottom line, it's data. It's just real. It's like saying, hey, this is where your face was, your path was. 
you know, using a flight scope or a track man, here's your data, here's your club ball data. Well, you have 3D data on all this stuff. And, you know, that, that whole idea that this is, we're actually starting to close the club face earlier at the top than we maybe thought er before. To me, that is very powerful. How many times you see an amateur's face open when yeah, the the ground coming into the ball? Yeah, you see that right there. Right now, they've got to stand the club up and do a lot of things to get it closed. Right. And then, you know, we can decide even is that the chicken before the egg that they started doing this that caused them to start to want to do that? Maybe right. some of them, right. you know, and throw it over because they can't get the club face closed enough to slice it back online because they're tired of hitting it way right. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a lot of them that ended up in that predicament over the top from that poor wrist angle. So let's talk again about shaft parallel to the ground to shaft parallel to the ground. Obviously impact four ten thousandths of a second. The only time the ball is told what to do in the golf swing. So that's really where it matters. Call it the moment of impact. Moment of truth. Yeah. Moment of so truth. what a lot of people don't realize is how much your forearms are moving. Okay. In that that scenario. I mean, they could move as, as fast as 6,000 degrees per second. This one supinating, this one pronating right there at impact. Holy cow, that much? So that's, that is the fastest thing moving on your body if you're talking about degrees per second at impact. It's definitely, you know, that motion that's happening. So I work a lot with players learning to, I'll grab this ball right here, to turn that wrist through impact. So I'll have them do little drills and this is on my Facebook page. I just did one client throwing me the ball and making it twist. Right. So what I want them to do is make it twist with their elbow down. Do that in so slow motion. Yeah. So I want that elbow down and then twisting with their forearm. Right. And then I'll use a, a lot of times a bigger ball and I'll have them pull that one and get them to twist this way. Right. And so when they're coming through impact, I want them to feel like they're twisting because this twisting started back at the top. Right. It just really goes fast through impact. And so we want them to go this way. What we see too often is that ball come up, you know, end over end this way. Well, I, I know I just wanted to pull up a, a video of me doing exactly what you're saying. So you can see here, here's exactly what you're saying right there. Exactly. See how much your forearms are twisting. And then a, another little component to that is the ulnar that you're putting in the ulnar release in your wrist. And I just left my good friend, uh, Jeff Leishman, and we, you know, showing my ball, he works a lot on that too, but he gets a little foam roller with his players to make them feel that owner release, that downward right. motion through impact, what you were just doing in that video. Right. And he showed me this just a couple of days ago that he was using to have them feel that rotation and the owner, because we need, we need that motion to push that club away through impact as well. A lot of people don't realize that one of the biggest measurements that I take is I use the center, the mid hands point in your chest. And I measure that and we want that to get longer through impact. And that comes a lot from that ulnar release. So we want this club moving away from you like so while you're going up and rotating. Right. We need that ulnar snapping through and that gives us speed as well. That's verticals. Yeah, so that, that's really helping a lot of players to understand. So everybody has can go get a ball or you know a, a little half foam roller and work on yeah. the wrist angles through impact. You don't need to know numbers, you just need to know fields. Right. right? And right. work on getting that thing pointed down. And then they won't be afraid to really twist that club because a lot of people are afraid or you're trying to hold the face square 
to where right. they're going and it's causing all kinds of problems. Well, I think a lot of people that I see, their grip is too strong for their hip rotation at impact. And I'm only 90% upper core where people's hips are not that rotated impact. And then they show up with this really strong grip. I had a gentleman yesterday, I bet his grip was off at least eight to 10 degrees from where it should be. So what do you think he's doing going through impact? He's got a super strong grip and he's yeah. can't turn. Yeah. And yeah. that's where that little twist drill would really help them. So even if you can't turn, you know, you can get them to throw it, right? twist it, and that'll speed up that twist for them to get the ball, the club back square. Because if they can't turn their body, if you can turn your body, it's great. Right. But if you can't turn your body, you can allow them to, to get that a little bit, and that club will look a little more like this through impact. So what do you say to the naysayers that say, well, how can you control that face with the rate of closure so much higher? Well, the, the, the original thing that I first did this, that's the lowest rate of closure there is anyway. Right. But somebody that can't turn, they, they're gonna have, they can need a little higher rate of closure. They'll never get the club face squared. So there's got to be a balance. Right. And I don't really care about the numbers higher. We had to, we had to talk about it some way, right? Lower right. or higher. But I like to work with it with the individual player. Yes, is this motion here a high rate of closure? Yeah, but there's a players that need that. You, you can look at, uh, you know, a uh, Patrick Reed coming through the right. ball with the kind of flat heel up. He runs it pretty high through there versus, you know, somebody else like a DJ or something that's really rotated open and right. closes the front face like that. But those match up to their body. Right. And I, I kind of almost like to quit talking about rate of closure because I think people get lost in this number versus the relationship to the body and the club matching up together. Well, what I think is really tough in this world of golf instruction is the, so many people are teaching an average tour player when most of us don't fit that model. And no, I mean, if they're gonna work on averages for your, let's right. say your average male golfer that's 40 would be a lot better off looking at the LPGA average than they would, you know, the average male golfer is probably about 100 miles an hour. And then the average lady on tour is probably 93 or something like that. But that'd be a closer fit to their whole game than trying to match somebody swing 120, 127 right. miles an hour. That's just crazy. Those are elite humans. Now, I have some amateurs that can swing that fast for sure. But that's pretty rare. I mean, yeah. dealing with the, the average guy, we need to, to look more at uh, what their bodies can do. Because right. everybody wants to come in, I want to look like DJ. Well, good luck. Go to the gym for two more years and then come back and see me. And then yeah, still but DJ's a freak. I mean, DJ's is a freak. Core. I've only measured 14 low core out of yeah. 1,100 people. I mean, I, I do not see, and there's not many low core players on tour. Not many at all. So, yeah, it's a, and yet, Everybody walks in the shop wanting to be that person. Well, <laughs> and so, I understand. Well, they like the guy. Yeah, but that that's just his natural swing. That's what he does. Yeah. He's got that left wrist like this at the top. You know, so it's uh, – he has found his swing. I think Butch taught him how to hit the ball straight or a cut, eliminate the left side of the golf course. He worked – really worked hard on his putting and short game, and that's why he's number one in the world. He's won two majors now, and – He'll be defending next week at the Masters and, you know, but that's not a swing many people can do. Uh, I've got a lady at the Ritz-Carlton Golf Club Orlando that is low, can get her hips rotated that much at impact, but very few people can. And it's, it's pretty interesting, but John, I just think as we kind of wrap up the show, I just think people have to have much more of an awareness of what the arms, hands, and wrists are doing from that shaft parallel to the ground, the shaft parallel to the ground, to whatever's going on. You still have to have a sense you're square in that club face at impact. Definitely. I think most people would gain a lot from not being afraid to 
spin that club and twist that club. They're going to find straighter shots. They're going to find that their face and path can marry up together better. You know, and trying to hold that face through impact or trying to hold off something to keep it from going left. I think hopefully that kind of instruction is all in the past. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting trying to keep this flat going through impact. <laughs> That lead wrist, uh, you know, it's- uh, But in closing, think, if you're actually trying to keep this flat, you're robbing yourself of so much speed. I agree 100%. <laughs> you don't let this thing go. And, and certainly whenever you're trying to mess with the inertia of something that's moving, you're slowing it down dramatically on top of, you're not even being able to transfer energy into the clock. So you're getting a double whammy for being slow. Well, it's interesting talking with you before the show and now during the show, how you were talking about it's really this hand and wrist creating the speed more than this one. And especially in the impact area and I'm left-handed, I play golf right-handed. So to me, I'm hitting this two-handed backhand as a lefty playing golf right-handed. And I really feel I'm cracking the whip and getting speed with my lead arm and hand my left arm and hand is a right-handed golfer yeah I, and i believe feeling it with your right is not bad with right the trail hand because we want it to go and that might be a feeling that just releases a player if, if they want to feel that and go after it i don't know. i have lots of players that feel very dominant with their right hand right but in reality if you're very dominant in your right hand you would be slower i mean just take your trail hand and hit a golf ball and take your lead hand and hit a golf ball, which one goes faster? It's definitely going to be your lead hand. And so we don't, we won't want that trail hand doing tons and tons. You don't see too many uh, videos out there of coaches banging balls with their right hand at distance. You see a lot of, you know, feels and motion, but when somebody really wants to hit it with distance, you see them always hit it with their lead side. Yeah. So I think that in itself is pretty much proof that this side's creating a lot of speed down there. Yeah, that's really interesting. I uh, I never thought of it that way. I knew you were going to have some great stuff tonight. I knew you were going to have some things that uh, I didn't really think of, but made a lot of sense. Well, John, it's always great to have you on the show. For more information on John Sinclair, you can go to SinclairGolf.com. That's S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R. Uh, golf.com and you're in Euless, Texas, just outside of Dallas. So John, keep up the good work. Thanks so much for all you're doing for us and uh, really appreciate it. I'd like to thank my sponsors, Tideless Foot Choy, the Ritz Carlton Golf Club Orlando and the Red Sky Golf Club in Vail, Colorado. Also Flight Scope and V1 Sports. Till next Thursday, keep swinging. See you later.